symbolize the investment or the real investment of somebody who is here, Mrs. Ruiko Frisaka. She prepared them for us, and they are like small reminders of his. There's a story about uh, a cane holding uh, effort by one girl, which was heavily uh, uh, not wounded, but uh, whatever she she became very sick because of I think it was a, a result of, of the atomic bomb which affected her life, and uh, there's like some some uh, belief that if you fold thousand grains, then your heads will come back. So she started to fold grains. Unfortunately, she didn't recover, but uh, the effort goes for the result. So please take these grains home with you to remind you a whole year until we meet next time for International Day of Peace, that peace somebody is investing that we can all live in peace. The next speaker, <laughs> the next speaker is Mr. Marvin Huber. And uh, it's very encouraging to see that Austria has since a few years always a UN youth delegate and he was Previous one, I think it's all we are used to get for two years, if I'm rightly informed. And uh, he will tell us something about the idea behind this project of UN Youth Delegates. And of course, he will say something why youth is important for peace. Microphone, yeah. Thank you, that helps. Um, I was not planning to speak too much about the UN Youth Delegate Tenure because unfortunately it has come to a close. But I was um, planning to speak about uh, what is really at the center and has been at the center of my work for these two years. And this was, um, and I think will always be in my life, to think of youth, uh, peace, and security as a common together issue. So, this uh, International Day of Peace, I was given the great honor. Uh, to share my truth about the state of our world and where we are heading. And I believe the following is the truth for many of us young people. Young people get told to dream big, while the present is so unfathomably broken that we don't dare to. Young people get told to trust our values, uphold morals and have open beliefs, whilst in our world the rule of law is disregarded for the power of the strong. Young people get praised as the leaders of the future, whilst no one is even capable of steering, steering our present. And with this I ask you, is it any wonder that young people are getting angry, frustrated, and lose trust in our institutions? I don't think so. But it's important what young people do with these frustrations. Young people turn them into action. And in my work throughout civil society, I had the greatest pleasure to meet hundreds of brilliant youth who are ready to walk the talk and push policy forward. Youth who organized aid for crisis areas, youth who protested government's foreign policy, and youth involved in ground breaking peace work. For me, one thing then directly became imperative, and that is peace desperately needs you. Peace needs youth as 50% of our global population is under 30, but not just as a demographic necessity, but a democratic imperative, and as a fundamental avenue for account the accountability of institutions, their mandates, their legal norms and to make sure they are really serving the people they're trying to serve. As the biggest group of users of technologies at the center of new and rising security challenges, maybe it's the artificial intelligence, 
Vehicle Automatic Weapon Systems or Hybrid Car Warfare in a Digital World. Diesen Ziel as multipliers of peace building work, extending their reach, impact, sustainability and effectiveness. Peace needs youth as a generation understanding that without peace there is no future, but peace alone cannot be eaten. You need more than that. You need to understand the intersectionality, intersectionality of human rights, peace and sustainable development. And peace desperately needs youth as a group which is ready to break the paradox that in many parts of our world they are seen as a democratic majority but feel like an excluded minority. Excellencies, now I'm soon to be. I have a favorite quote on peace uh, of Nobel Peace Prize laureate Jody Williams. And whilst I would have not put it that drastically, I want to share it with you. The image of peace with a dove flying over a rainbow and people holding hands singing Kumbaya ends up infantilizing people who believe the same peace as possible. If you think singing and looking at a rainbow will suddenly make peace appear, then we are not understanding the difficulties of our world. Thus, I want to share my view of what fighting for peace nowadays looks like in these challenging times. Fighting for peace means that all parties to conflict need to comply with international humanitarian law, international human rights law, and do this in all conflicts of our world. We need to defend the victims, fight aggressors, and realize that the end cannot justify the means. It is clear which parties in conflict do their best to adhere to these standards and minimize human suffering, and which don't. Fighting for peace nowadays means that nothing may bring us to deviate from applying these standards of international law to ourselves in all our acts. The Charter, the Geneva Conventions, and our ethical understandings must guide us. And fighting for peace must mean that we need to stay vigilant and enforce these standards. We must not turn neutral or accept the increasing severity of our world, our world crisis, but actively seek remedy and help the suffering on the ground or we are providing people safe havens. And for me, the following is the most fundamental. We may not just simply hope for peace or hide behind difficult debates if we are amongst the ones so privileged as not have to experience war. We need to work for peace. As with this, we have a world to win. And I shared, uh, I shared a quote earlier of Jody Williams who did this exactly. With the United Nations, the International Committee of the Red Cross and youth organization together, they created the international campaign to ban landmines. And they lobbied over two thirds of all countries in the world to join this convention. Over 150 states stood and they severely limited the production, the supply, um, and uh, the transport of arms and personnel. This not only meant that people who suffered from these uh, were finally given um, assistance, but 40 million stockpiled mines were actually uh, depleted. Our world is full of these success stories, and youth are always or often at the center of it, but, nearly, uh, but uh, get near attention. And an event which is currently going on, and has been mentioned two times, is also something that I want to put at the center the so-called summit of the future. And the most fundamental question I think all of us have to consider when talking about peace is the reform of the UN Security Council. For the first time in my life, and some guy called Antonio Guterres says, uh, for, the, for the greatest um, time in this generation, Security Council reform has taken place or will take place with the so-called pact of our future. Finally, there will be a process, hopefully leading to a reform, and finally, there are some steps taken to now already realize changes in the Security Council, which can be done without having to adapt the Charter of the United Nations. All of this is absolutely substantial, because the misuse of the veto, which we all know, has unfortunately blocked the United Nations system. <laughs> Whilst all of this seems reassuring, we unfortunately also have to realize that these took two young, long years of negotiations and also took, um, and unfortunately, this pact has not delivered on all fronts, such as nuclear disarmament or the need of automatic weapon systems. But it also shows that if we work for peace, we will succeed. And thus I call on all of us to not lose sight of the crisis, to not accept them, and to not lose our philanthropy with the people affected, to never forget our own privilege, not being in situations of war, to trust that with hard work we can change these terrible situations, to put this hard work into action and to 
finally realized that we need each other in this process, meaning me, peace, you, and media. Thank you. Martin, I have one question. Can you tell us the best experience or the most memorable uh, experience you had being a youth delegate uh, because you attended uh, uh, certain conferences, means you met certain unusual people. Uh, what uh, was your best experience or your worst or something you can never forget from these two years? <laughs> Incredibly badly. Uh, thank you so much for the question, Dorothy. Uh, sorry for messing up the format. Uh, uh, but I believe uh, the most important thing of being a youth delegate is that you take inputs forward. So um, in the best case scenario, you wouldn't exist. It would be a system where young people can directly talk to the policy makers. Uh, and uh, what we had the pleasure to do was to travel around Austria and all of Europe to see and seek young people's ideas, visions, and um, their demands for a, 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 a future being sustainable and peaceful. And I was able to take them forward. I was able to address the third committee. And I was able to work together with brilliant uh, people in the United Nations systems, which do their best to get young people involved. And uh, with this, I think I was able to have four words in a UN uh, resolution um, uh, naming um, that uh, young people should be given adequate space in the uh, summit of the future. So it's a hard, hard uh, work, two years of lobbying, uh, of meeting young people, to only get some phrases in the UN resolution. But in the end, it's way more about these direct connections. It's way more about making sure that um, young people feel heard and in the end, uh, they get back uh, what they have given to the process. Uh, thank you. <laughs> but one final invitation. I know this event uh, closes at five. Um, afterwards, I will be heading to the climate strike from Fridays for Future. If anyone wants to join me, you're uh, open. Uh, we can meet wherever. Thank you.